Right. So, uh, hi guys. Uh, today I'm presenting this paper uh, called Visualizing and Understanding the Delusion Networks. It was written by Matthew D. Zeller and Rob Curtis. Uh, so the basic uh, Right. So the basic idea of this paper was to uh, uh, create a novel visualization technique, like a new technique that gives you a little more insight into the function and the operation of the feature layers uh, and the classifier. Uh, so basically, it focuses on visualization, but also on feature generalization, since they train an image net model and then they generalize it to other data sets other image data sets like Caltech 101 and Caltech 256 and Pascal. Uh, right, so I'll, uh, before I like go into the paper itself, I'll just go over um, what the idea of uh, visualization is and uh, what, and convolutional networks, uh, network in their, convolutional networks in their architecture. So, uh, the idea of visualization is basically you try to gain intuition about the network itself. And uh, you have projections from the pixel, pa uh, pixel space in the first layer. And then the higher layers use the output from each previous layer to uh, create a sort of, to find a sort of uh, stimulus for each specific pixel or unit. Uh, and this is done through gradient descent and maximizing the activation of each unit. So uh, what uh, this looks, this paper looks at is majorly using convolutional networks to do this. And it is a very different kind of convolutional network, right? But what is a convolutional network in the first place is also a question. So, right. So the idea is of a convolutional network is basically you have an, uh, it's an algorithm where you have like an input image and then you assign some sort of importance of weights and bias to the various uh, aspects or to the uh, various objects or features in that image. And then this, then through filters, you learn the image features and you, uh, figure, you are able to differentiate between the uh, objects and the images. Mm -hmm. So the idea behind a CNN architecture is uh, basically to reduce computational um, uh, complexity and to be able to create a faster model as well as uh, be able to learn the features and characteristics so that it can do this on its own once you train it. So uh, this is done basically because the architecture is based off the neuron, neuron connectivity patterns that you see in the visual cortex of the human brain. And the visual cortex basically has these receptive fields. These receptive fields are like specific properties of a sensory stimulus that you know generates a strong response from the cell. So you can see a very similar pattern in a convolutional network because uh, there are, like, like I just said before, you have sensory stimuluses and the strong response here is your activation response to the cell, uh, to the part of the neuron that you're activating, right? Uh, so there's two major things in uh, a convolutional network, two major processes, as you can see. You have kernel and kernels and pooling, right? So your kernel is basically your convolution layer. So this is just a small uh, GIF of how it works. I'm pretty sure all of it, like you guys know it. But basically you just have a kernel that moves over uh, portions of the image that you decide. And uh, it does matrix multiplication over it, right? Now, uh, the idea is uh, that uh, you have a con convolved feature that you get from this matrix multiplication uh, to help you identify like the features. Um, just give me a second. Uh, and when you have, uh, so you see these convolved features that you get from the kernel. Uh, now, something, another important term with this is stripe. Uh, basically, stride is the distance that you're moving from one kernel to the shift of the kernel to go to the other portion of the image that you're looking at to create a convolved feature. So the stride length plays a role in how defined the feature is, what kind of frequencies of the of the image you will be looking at or focusing on. Uh, this is this this is 
spooling it's very similar to convolution i'm pretty sure you all know it there's two kinds of max to pooling max and average so in max pooling you pick out the max value in average pooling you pick out the average value of the the part of the kernels over now uh, the thing is that max pooling tends to be a little more effective in what it's trying to achieve simply because uh, it also pretty uh, it also in max pooling you also have noise suppression so it also helps to denoise the model that, uh, that you're creating through that particular layer so that's just an overview of the architecture of a convolution network because the convolution part of this network works on a very similar kind of architecture after this you'll have your fully connected layers and then you go into um back propagation and uh, gradient stochastic gradient descent right so uh moving on about uh, to the paper itself right uh, the paper itself can be uh, broken down into two parts visualization using a deconvolution network and visual visualization using a convolution network so what is a deconvolution network right because we're very familiar with cnns uh, you use it very widely in deep learning as compared to deconvolution network and it's basically what the name says it is a it is the reverse uh, or the inverse of a convolution network so uh, in a convolution network you sort of try to uh, map pixels to features right but in a deconvolution network you do the opposite you try to map the features to pixels so it helps you figure out or show what sort of input pattern is used to cause the given activation in a feature map and this is really helpful in unsupervised learning because it helps create a kind of network uh, through the mapping that can learn uh, and do better uh, better and find better ways to be able to uh, do an input pattern based on the activation given so uh, the idea of using it here is basically to create an unsupervised learning and the model they use is based on a deconvolutional network model created by zeiler uh, himself uh, this is a separate paper that i will also show uh, later on um I'll, which I'll show later on. So the idea behind this is basically you have three things: you have unpooling, rectifying, and a filter to reconstruct uh, the uh, data. So you can see that you have uh, the unpooling, and then you have the rectifying through the ReLU function, and then you have the reconstruction through the filter. So the unpooling is basically an uh sort of in, you're trying to inverse the pooling function that you perform so you take the switch variables that you have in the pooling function and you uh use the switches to place the reconstructions from the layer above into the appropriate locations so the uh uh so yeah so rectification is basically where you use uh, the relu nonlinearity and and uh, try ensuring that the feature map is always positive filtering again is basically just um transposing the filter and in in this kind of scenario it's basically you just flip each filter vertically and horizontally to transpose it and then you apply to the rectified maps you don't apply to the output of the layer beneath but the rectified maps or like how you have filters in convolution networks so the idea is uh, the the difference in this is that the relu is imposed independently and you don't use contrast normalization of operations so uh, there's a small shortcoming that they do mention uh, that the approach it it can visualize only single activation at a time uh, not the joint activity that would be present present in the layer and uh, there's also this um, idea of how it works this is from the original paper where the deconvolutional network model was created that they took from it so basically uh the idea here is that you can see the green boxes right those are basically uh what the feature maps that you're decomposing the input image y into and the red ones are the uh filters that i was talking about that you aggregate the outputs of at the reconstruct y then you can also see that there's like the input channels there are different input channels and you have and the blue uh the blue things are basically the 
uh, maps, the pooling maps. Uh, again, you can also see that I was talking about the switches and these are the yellow ones that are labeled S. Those are those switches, switch variables of use in the unpooling of the pool maps. Uh, right. Uh, the, now the second layer is, uh, the difference between the first and second layer is that they're conceptually the same, but you have a reduced number of input channels. Obviously this is just a very basic model. So you have like three feature maps and then two feature maps, uh, but then like it, it differ, it's, com it's different when you have more layers and then the actual model itself. But just to give you an idea of how you're basically uh, reducing the number of feature maps to finally be able to get that input image. Uh, so let's move on to the convolutional part of it, right? Um, yeah, okay, my bad. This was the this is basically the algorithm that they use for the deconvolutional uh, network. So this gives you a little more mathematical idea about how it works, where you have the gradient step, the shrinkage step, the pooling and unpooling, and the overall iteration. So I didn't want to go into the details of the math because it's very similar to what you do with convolutional networks, except you're basically reversing the procedure that you're doing for it. Right. Uh, okay, now we move on to the convolutional network and the convolutional network part is widely based of, the, of this paper, uh, which they also use as a benchmark for their results later on, the Krzyzewski uh, architecture. So this is also paper that I, I'll send over later so you can look at it if you want. Now, there's slight differences between this structure and the structure that they use. Uh, this is basically to fix certain problems that this structure creates. So when you apply the Krzyzewski structure in, um, the, in the ImageNet data set, you get somewhat of the B map. So A is without any features itself. B is if you uh, use the Krzyzewski's architecture for convolutional networks. And C is the uh, output of the first layer of the uh, convolutional network uh, of what this paper uses basically. Now, the problems with V are that you can see it's very fuzzy, right? Like the, there's a very, there's a mix between the high and low frequency information, but it doesn't really cover any of the mid frequencies. Also the second layer, it, there's a lot of, um, the D is a second layer output in the Krzyzewski architecture. And there's a lot of like um, blockages because of like the large artifacts. There's a lot of information that you're missing out on because the stride value is full. So it's a very big stride. So it's missing out on a lot of uh, factors, a lot of features that you could be looking at. So instead, what uh, the model that we use for this paper does is it reduces the first layer filter size from 11 into 11 to 7 into 7. And then it makes the stride of the convolution 2 instead of 4. So then you retain more information in your first and second features, right? So, uh, right. And then this is basically the actual model uh, of how it looks like, the architecture looks like. So it's basically an eight layer uh, convolutional uh, model you have image size, so the input image size that you're taking is 20, 224 into 224. And then um, you convolve it with 96 filters in this first red layer of the 2C. And then you get a, uh, and this, each of this is seven into seven, like I mentioned before, using a stride of two. Now, just, now when I'm saying a stride of two, I mean both in the X and Y direction. So it's a square of two in the two. So the resulting feature map that you see is like a 55 and 55 feature map. And uh, then you pass that feature map to a rally function and you uh, then pool the same thing using the same spread that you see over here. Three into three max pool with a stride of two. You also perform contrast normalization here itself. Uh, right. And then uh, the same operation is applied in layers two, three, and four. So you follow the same procedure again and again. Uh, layer six and seven are fully connected. So you take the fifth layer uh, uh, feature map, which will be your strongest feature map. And then you take it as an input in a vector form. And then uh, you apply it to the uh, fully connected layers to find any non-linear functions, right? And then you have this uh, soft mass, uh, mass classification layer 
that occurs over here. So uh, the idea is after that, you have the back propagation based on the derivatives of the loss that you do with respect to the parameters. And then you perform an um, updation as usual through stochastic gradient descent. The parameters in this scenario, again, is filters uh, per convolution layers and weight matrices for the fully connected layers. And uh, the loss function used is a cross entropy loss function. So uh, just to give an idea, this is how your layer five feature map will look like and how the classifiers look like. So this is from the paper itself, by the way. So, yeah. uh, if you want to look at the evolution of features, this is basically an evolution of the features and you can see how it gets stronger and it's able to identify the features much better in each layer. Uh, so then we go into like the generalization part, right? which I talked about how they did feature generalization. So uh, the second part of this paper came into that came into was basically the uh, feature generalization over other uh, other data sets. So what they did is they kept the one to seven layers of the ImageNet train model fixed, and then they trained like a new um, softmax classifier on top. Uh, they tried it with both SVM and softmax, as you can see over here. So the idea was that. The softmax create, uh, has very few parameters compared to the other layers, right? So it can be trained much quickly with a much smaller uh, data set number of examples as well. So you retain all the information from your previous layers, and then you try to apply an SVM or a softmax. Uh, so the idea was, uh, so yeah, that was a basic idea behind it. However, there was also one other thing that they did. They used normalized correlation to identify any overlap images, which was present, like which was especially present between Caltech and the ImageNet data sets. They removed that from the ImageNet training data set because if you have, because otherwise there'll be a train to test contamination between the data. Uh, then what they did is they did an analysis of it, right? So this is how the, this is the analysis uh, actually. Uh, what they did is they uh, varied the number of layers they retained the ImageNet model. So the brackets show the number of uh, layers retained. So this is like one layer retained from the image set model and so on. This is the seven layers retained from the image set model and then you apply an SVM layer. Uh, so you can see that there is an improvement as you, as you increase the number of retained layers. There's a, there's a much higher improvement that you can see. So uh, this, is, this supports the fact that the feature hierarchies become like more deeper and they can learn more increasingly powerful features. And by retaining more, uh, more already trained uh, layers from the image data set, you're having, you're having to do a lot less work. It's happening a lot faster by just adding a soft max or an SVM layer on top. Right, so basically uh, that's, that's pretty much the end. So just to summarize what the paper was talking about, it, um, yeah, so it shows you the uh, better visualization meta method or technique compared to the uh, benchmark paper that they use, the Krizavsky paper that they use. It also so shows that while using this model for classification, it's sensitive to the local structure of the image and not like the broader context sense of the image, because like there's a lot of earlier classifications use a broader context of the image instead of the features of the image to do so. Um, they also uh, show that it can be generalized over different, uh, different data sets as well. For example, Caltech 101 and Caltech 256. And they show the best reported results as well until this paper at least. So um, a few of the drawbacks and like future works that they saw was that it generalized less to the Pascal data. So this could also be, this could be because of a data set bias. So it would require some tuning for that reason. So, you'd, uh, so you could look at tuning at the model. Another work that they talked about was trying to use a different loss function. So that would help you or that, that uh, so they were talking about using a loss function that sort of uh, can identify multiple objects in the image and allow for something like that to happen. 
So you could tackle object or detection as well as classification from the model instead of just one use. So, right. So that was it for the paper. Thanks, guys.